fellowship is a transformative experience. Um, this is the first time, uh, the inception moment. And the idea is to build uh, a network, a statewide network of young artists centered around the fight for climate justice. At the forefront of our work together is a gathering of collective intention to build out new narratives for the international climate justice struggle. And our th the panelists today um, are all connected, I think, through that intention, building a new story um, from the fabric of our history. And to be honest, uh, I'm more of a fan than anything. Uh, I want to be these folks when I grow up. And I want to impact their vision and inspiration uh, through this conversation. I want you to get to know who these folks are, how and why they do what they do, because they are the solution in my estimation. So for the sake of time, we're just going to get right into it. The author, Walida Imarisha, writes, for those of us from communities with historic collective trauma, we must understand that each of us is already science fiction walking around on two legs. Our ancestors dreamed us up and then bent reality to create us. We are then responsible for interpreting their regrets and realizing their imaginings. Uh, this question is for each of you. What, if anything, are you interpreting from your personal history? And if at all, how does that inform your work? What, if anything, are you interpreting from the lives of your ancestors? What did they go through um, that you might draw from as it relates to your work um, on the ground, in the field, working with youth primarily uh, in California? Well, um, I think that a lot of my family line had um, a, lot of, a lot of trauma because um, I come from Irish and Mexican people from my mother and father's side. And um, I think there's a type of trauma on each side that I'm not even fully aware of. And to be honest, I'm not even fully aware of what I carry on my shoulders completely. But, um, you know, gen there is many generations of, of alcohol abuse um, that come in my family line. And um, I felt it with my parents, with my grandparents. And um, I think that that kind of informs me on and inspires me to try to break these cycles and to maybe um, try to, to try really hard to not, to resist um, some of those, some of those things that society has kind of, um, how, the way society has affected us in those negatives in those negative ways, mm -hmm. um, but I also see a lot of bravery and a lot of yeah, like I said, positive inspiration mm -hmm. from my from my ancestors. And to be honest, I was never really taught growing up to be in tune with ancestry at all. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until later in my life that I started meeting um, a lot of people like around the Caligori and and just in general that. Um, that really gave me hope because they would, they would be, they would talk about getting in tune with your lineage and with mm. the energy that you're carrying, and so I think even just now I'm barely starting to like try to realize that fully, and it's, it's good. On your journey. Yeah. yeah I'm pass. I didn't introduce anyone. Oh. <laughs> Why don't you say your name? Oh yeah, my name is uh, my name is Michael Gallagher. I'm part of the California Allegory Youth Fellowship. Um, I'm a writer, an artist, musician from Oakland, California. Thank you. Um, I'm Bronte Velez, and I'm uh, an educa food justice educator with Planting Justice uh, based in Oakland, and um, I'm also the creative director of an organization called um, Led to Life that makes, um, is making shovels from weapons um, and hold uh, tree planting ceremony at sites impacted by violence. Um, I think that practice, I think um, a lot of, I don't, I don't, because of um, the, 
the project of white supremacy erases me is a pro is a project of erasing memory. I don't um, a lot of it a lot of what I feel attuned to is speculative, mm. um, which I'm grateful for Walida's mm. um, work of science fiction and kind of I also am in this process of piecing together what I imagine um, my ancestors um, attended to um, f attended to within their own uh, spirits and dreams in order to um, support their liberation. So I often um, feel connected to Harriet Tubman's fugitivity practices um, and recuperating the depth of what it required in the context of her time to say she, to declare that she was free um, and to trust that her freedom practices required uh, collective liberation with other black folks. Um, the depth of her wisdom with terrain reconnaissance, reading stars, herbalism, caring for elders, um, listening to her dreams, um, being attuned to spirit, working with the earth as an ally are all uh, practices I feel uh, bring me now into breaking through what has been imagined for me as a black Latinx um, person and to decide that I another way is possible. Mm. Thank you, Bronte. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing today? <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, before I introduce myself, I want to acknowledge that we're gathered here in the village of Yalamu on occupied Ohlone territory and give thanks to all of those ancestors who tended to these lands for thousands of years before any of us got here. Um, my name is Nidia Alicia Garcia Torres. I'm a first generation Chicana born in the Tecalma the land of the Tecalma people in so-called Southern Oregon, the Rogue Valley. And this remembrance of land is what helps me stay rooted and helps direct the work that I'm here to do um, as a human being. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that comes down with uh, who are you from and where are you from? And who are you accountable to? And these have been some of the most powerful teachings that have helped me uh, make meaning of who I am and who I'm meant to be in a society where our narratives aren't reflected in a positive way, where uh, we're so stripped from our cultural ways, we're so stripped from uh, the wisdom that our communities and our people have had for thousands of years, all of that wisdom that was refined through so many years of oppression that our pe a lot of our peoples have survived and endured. And one of the ways in which I have been steered in, this, in this, these past four years more so has been that remembrance that as a, as a first generation Chicana that, who's not uh, native to this land here, particularly in California, um, it's all it's it's the seeds and it's the things that my ancestors have left before me that have guided me to work with um, with some of the most incredible women that I have the honor of working with and that's Chief Kelly Sisk of the Winnemowentu Tribe and uh, Auntie Karina Gold here in the Bay Area who does incredible work for the protection of sacred sites and this keeps me connected because. In order for, for me to do the work that my ancestors have cut out for me, I need to make sure that the waters where I reside are okay so that my seeds can grow, so that my ways and who I am and who I'm meant to be in this world can continue to exist. And mm. it's a beautiful thing to uh, still have some of those things, you know, when 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 folks came over, when the colonizers came over, they took a lot from us. And 
Um, a lot of that, a lot of things were stolen from us and, and taken away, but those few things that we do have, we need to trust that those few little cultural things that we have are, are meant to, they're here for a reason and for whatever reason they survived and if we could listen deeply into, into what they're telling us and what they're asking of us, I feel like that can help us all find a common ground as to how we can work together to co-create and weave the narratives that are gonna help steer us in the right way so that our Mother Earth can heal, so that the future generations can arrive and, and have a future and have clean water and have beautiful land to, to grow in. So that's, that's how I feel about that. Thank you. Oh. All right, um, uh, my name is Kanok Yisrael, and I'm, uh, um, I've been called many things, but they're calling me an urban farmer now. I'm out of Sacramento, California. And so just the first thing is that I want to say is that the statement, um, I really resonated with the statement because growing up in my family, at least one to two generations back, there was no discussion of any culture whatsoever. Um, so I understand the whole idea of being a walking around science fiction because everything <laughs> that I've become once I started to examine, you know, culture and traditions and rituals are things that I had to actually put in place in my own life, period. So I, that really resonated with me. Um, also, um, as far as, you know, my own personal history, mm. Luckily, my, 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 my parents, um, my mom, on her, my mom's side, um, we have a few librarians in our family. So we have, I can go back at least two generations where my great grandfather was a farmer in Texas, mm -hmm. you know, a landowner, uh, one of those people that, you know, will be looked at as, you know, somebody who's escaped, you know, oppression in some, some kind of way to be able to start taking care of themselves. And then also I have a, um, I have a, a I, I don't know if it's a great uncle or however it would be called, but his name was Hiawatha. Mm -hmm. And so it's rumored that, you know, we have some ties um, to Cherokee. Um, so anyways, needless to say about those things, when I started to finally put my hands back in the soil, which was about 2017, uh, 2007, um, it was like there was this immediate transformation that started to take place in me. And by 2011, I had decided to leave my job, leave my corporate job, leave the total corporate existence alone. And just from, from that point, I'm gonna be farming. And then even going through the whole idea of first starting with rotor tillers, uh, you know, and really just doing conventional practices in an organic way. And then going from learning about biointensive and then biodynamic and then permaculture and then understanding that these are all just indigenous practices in the first place. Mm -hmm. that you're now packaged into something else. It's been this journey, um, and it's also reconnected me back with the ancestors, because just like you were saying, um, the whole idea of erasing memory. Um, but, you know, one thing that can't be erased is, is our DNA, and so it's like there's, all of these things are still here, and as we start to practice um, you know, and it, you can use the uh, term like be the change that you want to be. But at the same time, it's really just about once we start to practice those things, then there's something inside of us that will awaken and then mm. will automatically then start to reconnect us to the things that you were talking about, Harriet Tubman. Like, like how was she able to like break out of that whole cycle because everybody else was thinking one way and she was like no I don't believe that and she was able to to draw strength um, and draw power and then the courage to mm -hmm. be able to like I'm going to do something that's so different and whether my life is on the line or not it's those things that ultimately I think um, as far as my own personal history that I've been able to reconnect to that kind of inform the way that I'm able to move and, and the way that, you know, I, well, I don't even like, I don't think I'm able to move. I think I just end up getting moved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's usually what ends up happening. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of what, how my personal history just informs the work that, that I do today. Thank you. Oh, I guess we're going to hold on to that one. Okay. In the same vein, um, thinking a little bit more, orienting ourselves towards the youth, mm -hmm. um, the saying, we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children, 
speaks to the very human dilemma we find ourselves navigating, moving through an unprecedented transition into an unprecedented age, the age of information. So trying to connect um, mental health to this uh, education from our history. Um, through your work, um, those of you who work with youth, um, in what ways uh, can youth maybe prepare themselves or how can we prepare youth for this new set of circumstances as we transition? Hmm. Okay, I think I'll take, think about that for a sec. I you know Bronte and Canoke work with youth exclusively, Michael as well. Um, so um, when we started the farm um, in 2011, um, it was purely because I wanted to be able to provide food to uh, my, my family at a cheaper price because it was just something that was totally unsustainable. Even though I was working in the IT field and you know I was tenured there, I still couldn't put the food that I needed to put on the table. Mm. And so I decided that I was going to grow food in the backyard. But in the midst of doing all that, I learned some things that don't have anything to do with farming, and that's the whole community aspect and the social educational piece, because our family was now eating outside. Uh, we're now working together in the garden um, before, you know, we, we, we got big with it. And then at the same time, we're, we're cooking together uh, and passing on those skills at the same time. And then, and then this happening in the backyard, so we decided that we wanted to share that with the community. And so... Um, we've tried to do a whole bunch of different things, but at this point, we've kind of decided that there's three ways that we can really help to impact the youth. And the main one is through not necessarily just teaching about agriculture as, okay, we're going to grow food and somebody's going to sell it, but actually culture, not agribusiness, but agriculture, where you're learning about, you know, harvest ceremonies and you're learning about before every time you get ready to plant the seed, there was a ceremony. Mm -hmm. And But, you know, it was time to harvest, there was a ceremony. There was a ceremony for just about everything that you did on, on the land. So not even looking at it as a farm, but just mm -hmm. as a space where all of these activities can take place in an integrated manner. Healing can take place mm -hmm. on the land. Um, you don't even necessarily have to call it out. You can just invite people onto the land. And, and them being in that natural environment, it does it for you. You know what I mean? So it's, it's really about imparting, or not even really imparting, but, but exposing them to the environment, and then it will start to speak to them because our young people still have the voice. They can still hear, right? As we get, become adults, we lose our hearing, and they can still hear things that nature is, is, is saying. And so just inviting them to that environment, which we do with our program where we do 100 hours in the summer, um, and we go from the time the seed is planted, to cooking, to the, 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 the looking at what the ancestors did. We do the seven directions. We learn about pouring libations. Uh, we learn about all of those different things, as well as then how to compost and how there's a cycle that takes place throughout nature as we see in the year. And I think that those things and, and restoring that connection are the things that are most important when it comes to uh, teaching the youth. Talk about it. So, can you repeat the question? Yeah. That was a long question. I really want to, it was very, very packed, so I really want to make sure I honor, I honor it. The saying, we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children, speaks to the very human dilemma we find ourselves navigating through an unprecedented transition into an unprecedented age the age of information, mm -hmm. um, tying in the idea of mental health through this transition. Um, what ways can youth prepare themselves for this new set of circumstances? Mm. So as I'm, as I'm hearing this again, I, I'm reminded of a very special moment that I shared with uh, some youth this summer. So uh, I'm a, I have the honor of being a community organizer and youth program coordinator with uh, Green Action for Health and Environmental Justice. And that led me to the Salinas Valley this summer where I had the 
the truly the privilege of coordinating an environmental justice youth leadership academy with 10 incredible youth and um, a lot of the process of us coming together with the material that we wanted to really unpack in the in the month that we were going to be together uh, was was done in a co-creative process and 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 in that the youth uh, requested that we could really dive deep into into our cultural our cultural understanding of who we are as people you know mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it it can get really muddy for, for folks, especially I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of a first generation person who um, is a descendant of the original peoples of this continent, but does not reside on my ancestral land. The land where I reside is, is someone else's ancestral land. And so like, what does that mean for me to be uh, who I am in, in the space that, that I'm at? And so one of the things that, that the youth really wanted to do was unpack that. And it had, you know, it got a little intense for me because I was like, oh, I'm going to have to really fight for this for, for, to validate the importance of cultural uh, teachings mm. with environmental justice. And like, how am I going to do that? Mm. And ultimately, it just like came down to we cannot be who we are meant to be in this world if we do not know who we are, if we do not know who we come from where we come from and who our people have been. And it's incredibly significant for folks who are not seeing themselves and their stories out in the world to really dig deep and to feel supported in that, um, to feel encouraged to go home. And one of the, one of the homework assignments that, that came out of, out of this for the students was go home and talk to your elders. Mm. Mm. Go home and, and talk to your grandma. Call your grandma. Mm. When was the last time you called your grandma? Call her and have a conversation with her. What was her life like? What were the things that her elders told her? What were the things that your grandpa did? How was your life shifted from your parents? You know, and a lot of us find that not, not, too, far, not too far down the line, one of our relatives was deeply in, in deep relationship with Mother Earth to where you could not conceive ever harming something that you are so dependent and reliant on. And uh, a lot of the students, after doing this assignment, felt really, really empowered. And it was, uh, it was almost like this light turned in their head. And they were like, wow, this, these, these teachings that, that I grew up with actually have value. Mm. You know? And I think we fight that a lot in the society. You know? as, a, as a bicultural woman, um, I used to fight my mom all the time. <laughs> my mom had all these like things and, and superstitions is what some folks would call about, um, about how to heal uh, with herbs and how to, how to prevent illness that was totally contradicted by Western medicine. And as a kid, I grew, up, I grew up in that intersection of questioning my mom who was leading me in, in the way that her grandmother led her. And it, it, it's so sad that a lot of us have to do that, that we go through that process where we, we seriously question like those deep old teachings that that our our elders gave us, and so for I feel I feel like and we we discussed this with with the youth um, that after we we were able to see that and even for them as as high school students to see someone else um, who's older and a little more experienced give significance and value and importance to them going home and having an assignment that just requires them to sit down and talk to their elders, to their parents. Um, I feel like that made a difference for them in how they were able to receive the rest, um, the rest of the academy and how they were um, framing their lensings of, of what it means to be them, what it means to be um, migrant farm worker youth in a valley that gets sprayed with 8 million pounds of pesticides and, and how to how to really root down at the, at the, at the root of, of the importance of, of standing up for Mother Earth and standing up for our lands and our waters in this time. And so I think it's important for some of us to, to take that responsibility as folks who are a little further along and to, to look back, you know, to, to look behind us and look at all those young people who are, who are you know, in elementary school and middle school and high school who are looking to us 
it's important for us, and we, I know we all have that, we have nieces and nephews, to look back and say, hey, you should look back too. Look at the people that you come from. Talk to them. Know who you are. Know the good and the ugly, because both of that needs to be healed, and it can only be healed and, and remediated in the here and now, which is us. Thank you. Yeah, go for it. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, to the question regarding, yeah, I think, I think about my own um, mental health as someone who's 24 and um, the, um, yeah, I feel afraid a lot of times um, about this moment that we are in. Um, this un this unprecedented future, and also feeling the responsibility of being a teacher, um, and um, feeling the many things that we're trying to hold, both in resistance to asking for support from elders now, to attend to our own mental health, and to keep the to open my own capacity to stretch, to be able to hold more complexity so that I can support young people's mental health who have so much more perspective than we could have ever imagined. I mean, I, the kids that I am around right now, I just am like, how do y'all know all this what? stuff? And they're so smart and like wise and yeah, they're so close to their spirits um, still. And so how to protect their imagination feels so essential. Um, and how to get out of my own, how to be so, how to be grounded in my own um, spirit, so so that I can show up to them, um, and so that I can be available for their wellness, and so and to really attend to my own wellness um, in community, and um, I think that has to come through ensuring that um, our young people are not are brought back to their bodies. Um, and I think that comes through somatic healing. And I think so much of the industry, the medical industrial complex um, is, and, and inside of, again, white supremacy has been to disassociate us from our bodies. Um, though it, it is so much about our body. It's so much race, the racial, the project of racializing us is about the body and yet we're take. You you can't be with your body. Your food is taken. Your um, it doesn't matter what you put into your body with your food. Mm -hmm. It just becomes all about like, yeah. It becomes all about the mind. Um, and we're so unwell. It's such an unwell um, environment. Um, so I think one way is to just really support babies being in their bodies. Um, and I think being in the body of the earth to do that and to see that we're, um, we are part of the earth. And the most essential work is just to help them remain in relationship. As mm -hmm. soon as they, as soon as they start to feel like they're an individual and that they're alone and that they're separate and that they're isolated is when all of this trauma starts to mm -hmm. become inflicted because you don't feel like you can call upon something greater than yourself, which is also you the, with the earth. Uh, this other resilience that's always around you. Um, and that I feel like with my, with uh, the students that I get to learn from and serve, they, um, I try to just, a lot of my classes focus on source, um, coming back to source. How do we, how do when everything around us is separated from source and we can't identify where things come from, how do we start to imagine where the supply chain processes and how things got there and how they got here and who they come from? And just seeing them already be so wise and then see them come back to source in themselves, it's so deep. <laughs> <laughs> it's so deep. And I come back. I come back to source with them. So, um, yeah, just keeping them close to their bodies. Thank you, Bronte. I know Michael works pretty extensively uh, with at-risk at risk youth who have been um, disregarded by our public school system. Yeah, so um, I guess I wanted to start with saying I feel like the first 
thing, the first platform or environment I ever got into that let me have like rage and let me have like <laughs> any emotions I wanted was was punk rock. And like my my father is in from East LA, Mexican punk rocker. Um, it was in a band, anarchist band, environmental justice band called Circle One, and I didn't grow up with him much, but like I knew kind of about it. And later in my life, um, I started playing the bass, and my mom was like, "You don't even realize your dad played bass, you know?" And it was like really like weird and almost like it was really heartbreaking because like I was never close to him, but it was coming full circle somehow. Like without my like I wasn't reared really, I, but I knew kind of. So then later I found out more about it and I was like, I'm doing the same thing. And then, um, so we're providing a space for kids to be angry and to scream and to just mm -hmm. be like, mm. have all those instincts like inside of them just come out. And then a little bit later, um, a few like, I would call them guides or angels, um, saw me like read some poetry somewhere. And then um, this lady, Tama Brisbane from the With Our Words organization, Spoken Word Youth Poetry Organization, mm. she's like, you see what's going on and we want you to have like a platform and I was like all right so then I I met all these other kids that were doing the same thing they were like actualizing and transforming mm -hmm. and um then we went to Brave New Voices and it was like like you know like the ceremonies like a giant ceremony of freedom and people getting free on the stage like I'm talking like crying on the stage like telling you their deepest most darkest fears in public and taking control of them and like yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Um, and I think that all those ceremonies that let us take control and let us uh, let free whatever that darkness is inside you is um, a positive experience and a form of therapy that's not provided by t for our youth mm. in the public school system. Or in um, we don't have enough community centers. We don't have enough outlets and support for that therapy. So, you know, people can call them open mics, but I think they're therapy sessions and mm -hmm. um, I think they're deeper than that too. They're like, our, they're a church for me. That's my religion, to be honest, is to just like, you know, like let that energy flow. And um, even, even like if you can just put that platform, put someone on a stage or put a guitar in someone's hand or read a poem to them, like I think those small things are they're like planting seeds for, mm -hmm. for future generations of, of, of trees, of rising trees, or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. Indeed, I think it's, it's uh, understated how important the inner work is before doing the outer work. Um, this idea of sustainable activism. Yeah, and, and I just want to say one more thing. Like, there was a lot of kids in the public school system. We were, like, I was doing skateboarding classes um, in Berkeley for mm -hmm. a while for kids. We provide skateboards for them. And there was a lot of youth that were confident and wild, mm -hmm. but they were deemed as trouble, mm -hmm. troubled kids in the school because they were confident and they had a wild spirit. But you, th you give them a skateboard and they're like a hell of a good skateboarder, you know what I mean? Because like you thrive off of confidence and being crazy like as, as a skateboarder. And I think like teach, maybe not the teachers, but the administration, they need to recognize the differences between kids and and put them on a path that's going to nurture them instead of like um, they give them an instrument and make them follow notes with a bigger band just and it just teaches them conformity and it teaches them to try to accomplish things for material items like trophies and awards but um, I, I think that they really need to just be encouraged to explore the inner workings of their own life. Thank you Michael. Yeah. Oh, I'll just hold it, sorry. <laughs> You meant that. Uh, so in the interest of time, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, and I want to allow questions from the audience. So if anyone has anything brewing, uh, let it simmer a little bit. Um, and in the meantime, I, I always want to know as, as leaders, how you take care of yourself. Um, you're doing a lot of giving. Um, and so I, I personally am interested to know um, how each of you practice self-care uh, and how you think that may be a subversive action. Um. Um, I, to be honest, I've been um, learning this a lot more recently about self-care because for a long time I wasn't as um, nurturing to myself working too much, drinking too much, things of that nature. And I honestly think 
being incredibly vulnerable is a really important part of that. And like as a as a straight male, like acknowledging that I don't have to be tough all the mm-hmm. time and I don't have to be like like um like the way that you're conditioned to believe that that I am. Like I can be I can cry and I can like have emotions and um and really just be open to like to criticism too without mm-hmm. like hating myself for it but mm-hmm. to be open to for people to be able to like give me feedback without taking it personally and like try to like nurture yeah that openness I, and like po- like I was saying poetry is probably one of the first things that got me into that was to being open and honest and uh, vulnerable art is therapy mm. um I've been I was reading something about how like the new form of uh, self-care is kind of in this like commodification of self-care mm. that it's like this this industry now of self-care and there mm. are these things that you have to you have to outsource your self-care and it's still an individual practice mm. um, so I used to be like self-care is when I go get my nails done and I go get my eyebrows done and then I go get my massage and I'm still like all in like it's all still contingent upon capitalism mm. um, not that you can't get your nails and eyebrows done. Um, mm. <laughs> hey! But that, what, do, what does it actually mean? And what, is, um, what does my wellness look like? Mm. Um, what, what does it look like to, liber- to like, um, be supported in my wellness and to invite in support for my wellness and to be in a re- in relationship with others so we're getting well alongside one another. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's a new thing that I'm inviting in because I've definitely been in a season of isolation uh, because I thought that self-care meant I need to go hide and go be, her- be in hermitage and then go and then come back to com- society well. Um, and now vulnerability has been what mm-hmm. has brought me into deeper wellness to be like, yo, I'm actually not well. I'm actually afraid. I'm actually, I'm actually hurting. I'm doing way too much and I need help. <laughs> help me. <laughs> and I want to help you. And I want to be visible in that healing. And I want to make that. Yeah. I want to do that collectively. Um, yeah. And you're still and here. water and water. Any thoughts on India? Canoke. Self-care. I mean, let's just unpack the way that it's framed. Self-care, um, the idea that I have to take care of myself. Uh, I just, you know, and I'm sitting here with some of my housemates who are, I mean, some of my community members here who are such a big part of my wellness. And I just want to make the distinction between, between that because I think for a while I was like, self-care, I need to be able to take care of myself and need to be able to tend to my own wounds and to my own needs and not need anybody, which can lead us down the road of isolation and and further perpetuate our our illness um, in the moment, whether it be mental or, or physical or emotional. And in living in community, I have the privilege and honor of living a, in a, a little urban farm in the city um, called Canticle Farm. Y'all are welcome there. Uh, Tuesdays, oh. we have community dinner. Uh, And one of the biggest teachings that I've received in my time there has been that, to me, self-care means taking care of each other. Mm -hmm. Um, Because if I'm not well, then that's going to pour into my, 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 my relationship with other people. And if other people aren't well, that's going to pour, pour into me as well. And so I think a lot of times, um, yeah, we're fed this idea that, oh, I got to go get a massage and like take care of myself. But Actually, we're, we're surrounded by so many people that have so many gifts and talents. And um, I've been really on this journey recently of exploring, um, sharing my gifts and, re- and exchanging my gifts with people. Like, instead of going and getting a massage and paying someone else who I don't know, um, is hitting up one of my neighborhood friends who I know has some strong hands and be like, hey, can you, I'm really needing a massage right now. Can, can we exchange uh, healing he- healing?" energy right now and um yeah I also want to like just give the mad disclaimer that I'm a I'm a I'm a chronic extrovert so <laughs> I have no problem like hitting up my roommate be like yo I need a hug or just uh 
restoring and nourishing myself in that way. So, I mean, I'll speak to the way that I, as an extrovert, I take care of myself. But um, really want to encourage us um, to imagine self-care as something that we can hold together to where if you're in a deep hole, uh, know that you don't have to dig, climb out of there alone. Have that courage to reach out for help. Um, and have that assurance that, that you being well is just as important as anything else mm. that is on your to-do list. And, um, yeah, that's been one of the biggest things that I struggle with, too, because even, like, this week I've been, like, <laughs> sleeping, like, not as much as I know I should. So, um, and it's a journey, too, you know. I think another thing about self-care is, like, we can't be so hard on ourselves mm. all the time as to knowing what we need to do and then not doing it. It's, like, be gentle with yourself, ultimately, above all. Be gentle with yourself. It's, it's a cold, tough world out there. And so, um, yeah. I can leave it off with that. Thank you, Nidia. All right, so self-care. Yeah, I, I agree with the, everything that everybody said so far, um, especially that. But for me personally, um, I try to do things. I try to do things um, like as soon as, like I have things that I, like I'm, if I have to be somewhere, like if I get up in the morning and, and I have something to do, I'm, I'm usually up two hours beforehand and I'm doing certain practices. Like as soon as I wake up in the morning, as soon as I open my eyes, I just just kind of be thankful, mm. just kind of sit in that. And then I have some affirmations that I deal with as soon as I get up in the morning while I'm laying in bed. You know, it may be something to, you know, I may just say, hey, I know I'm supposed to help somebody. I'm supposed to give something to somebody today. I've done, I've done that. And, you know, just hopefully I'll know when I'm supposed to do that. You know, so there are some things that I like to set intention before I get started in the daytime. Then usually in the middle of the day, about two o'clock or so, I try to just stop and just be in the space that I am. And, and if I need to slow down, I can't always do those types of things. But, you know, those are just some of the types of things. And then like before I get ready to go to sleep, I just really think about my day what I've done throughout the day, what kind, of, uh, what kind of interactions that I had, were they positive, negative, was I positive, negative, you know, just kind of just checking in with myself before I get ready to go to sleep. And those are things that I do on a day-to-day on a -day basis. And then at least one day out of the week, um, I try to, if all possible, not spend any money. <laughs> not spend any money, not do any business. And when I say business, I'm saying going somewhere, buying something, getting caught up in the, I have a whole bunch to do, just kind of slowing down, you know, detach. We're always trying to like remake the world in the way that we want to, you know, as we walk through the earth, you know, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to be here, but just kind of, you know, being a passive participant in the world where you can walk around and, you know, maybe go on a hike or something or, or sit in a chair. I know for me, these are things that may seem s small, but to see me sit down for like more than 20 minutes um, is like, somebody's like, are you sick? Something wrong with you? Those types of things. So really being able to, to kind of sit down and relax and not be connected to the, you know, the, 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 the finishing or the completing of some kind of goal that's somewhere, right? Those are the things that, that, I, that I do for self-care. And also spending family time, mm. um, doing things like, you know, like play Bananagram, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody played before? Oh, yeah. All right. All right. I just got turned on to it, though. I'm, I'm brand new to the banana banana gram. So doing things like that where you can, um, you know, spend that type of time. And for me, because, you know, I'm 43. Um, so um, it's one of those things of actually I get an opportunity to be a child again for for a few minutes. And I really enjoy those times when I can. So, yeah. Thank you all for sharing. Um, did, did we have any questions? OK, uh, let's see. Maybe you come up. Uh, somehow you were at war with your mom, the one that gave you life. And I'm saying this to you because I've seen it. I've seen it in myself. How is it? Hello? Okay, I'll speak closer. 
How is that? Can you catch that? Because you're younger, you're closer to when that happened. But how is it that our culture, because if you look at traditional cultures, they don't do that. And it's not because it's knocked into them. They respect their elders. And there's this deep connection to nature, and the elders know that connection, and that's guiding the children. But somehow our culture has got us all to think of our parents as ignorant, stupid, and yet you're gaining your sanity through uh, connecting to that elders. So I, I'm just asking, how is it? Can you guys recall that? If, why did I think my mom is stupid? Why do I think she's superstitious, what have you? How did that happen to all of us? Anybody feel called to that specific question? Bronte? We have, we have, we're running really close on time. So, wow, yeah. I mean, <laughs> speaking from experience, I can, I can say that uh, that was very much informed by the fact that I was, I was, uh, I am a first generation living in a country that does not reflect who my people have been. And so, uh, looking around, I don't, I don't see, I, I wasn't able to see my mother's teachings reflected in news, mm. in media, in teaching, in, in anywhere. Not my teachers, none of the elder, none of the teachers or, or adult figures in my life at the time were validating what she had to say. Mm. Um, so it put me in a really... Yeah, it put me at war with myself, where at home it's like I'm receiving these learnings and being raised in this way that is in total contradiction to um, what's appropriate and okay in school. And like, and like my American culture contradicts my Mexican culture, my Mexican culture contradicts my American culture, and uh, my grandma contradicts all of it. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, it just, it just took me a while to really realize and, and, and you know, and it, at that point, it also came to me this this message from this other elder, where she was uh, calling us to be very mindful of what we al allow to enter into us uh, through our eyes, what we see, through our ears. You know, the television was always like demonized, and and my mom would always say like, "Television is the devil's weapon." And I was like, "Mom, you're crazy! Like, television's fine. Like, it's okay. Like, why are you demonizing um, the television?" Um, and yeah, it. I guess it just made me be a little more inquisitive as to who is who is broadcasting this. What is their intentions? What do they want to get out of me? What ideas and thoughts do they want to insert into me so that I can then be of service to to them and what they want and so in our society I'm pretty sure we're we're very well aware that um that we're existing with with there's these forces that um are keeping us disconnected and are keeping us away from the true remembrance of of what it means to be human on this planet earth and so um yeah, I don't really know if that answered your question, but. Piggybacking off it, we can finish here. Um, because we have this platform, if you have any events coming up, anything you want to promote, um, in answering that question, we can go down the line and just. Uh, anything, if, it, if it's there. The, the venue today at four. Ah, where is it? We have a uh, California Allegory celebration today at 4.30. Uh, at the Women's Center, right down the street. Um, got some food, got some drinks, and some art. Yeah, and um, you can also check out Can School Farm, Sustain Us, and the Beehive Collective. Those are the kind of the three organizations with the California Algorithm Youth Fellowship that are doing a lot of the coordinating. Um, but personally, like one, one thing I like to do is to do free workshops. Um, at, in public spaces for the youth. Um, we just did a series of zine making workshops and actually in Stockton, California and downtown Stockton and to get youth and uh, make, they can make their own zines for free. So that's one outreach um, option that I personally um, was involved in. Mm -hmm. um, we're, on, we're on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs>
Instagram. <laughs> um, and Instagram and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, does anyone else? Yeah, I think I think we often forget that. Um, I feel like with social media, we we're like it's. I feel like a lot of outreach happens to like a certain population of people who have digital access um, and who have that skill so this what you're asking what you're asking encourages me to think to just be attuned to people who maybe aren't on um the internet in the same ways and finding other ways to do outreach um and also i think i feel supported when other when folks like request help for uh that or hold ask youth to be ask us hold us accountable with how we are just totally digital like uh, centric, but if you do have uh, Instagram, um, <laughs> uh, my or can get a youth to help, um, or somebody who works with it. I uh, our Instagram for our organization is Led to Life L E A D the number two L I F E, and we are gonna be having a dinner um, in the fall. Our website is Led to Life dot org T O. Um, we'll be having a dinner in November, um, late November here in the Bay Area, and then we'll also be having some events with the Guns to Shovels work and tree planting work um, in the King Holiday Weekend in 2019 in January. Um, so you can follow me in that way. Yes, I want to say something to, to your question, uh, how to support uh, our youth in this time. Uh, as folks who are older, it's important for us to remember that the future is this is their future. So I think one of one of the one of the biggest ways in which I've seen elders support me has been to just truly listen, sit and listen to what these kids and what these youth have to say and what they think. And I don't think we do that enough. I think a lot of times, even even myself when I was younger, as young people, we're invited into someone else's idea, into someone else's narrative into someone else's vision and strategy. And that's, that's great, but it doesn't really give room for, for our youth or for us to move forward in a brave way to really, and feel supported to manifest and bring to life our visions and our ideas um, in terms of what we think is necessary for our future. And... Uh, Tying that into some of the work that I do, that's one of the greatest things that the elders that I've worked with, Chief Kelly Sisk and Karina Gold, have have done for for myself and for other youth organizers. Um, during, uh, f as we've been organizing for the Run for Salmon, yeah. which if if most of you don't know, the Run for Salmon is a two week long prayerful journey that um, aims at raising awareness about the importance of protecting our waters and our watersheds, knowing their names the importance of restoring endangered species and the importance of uh, revitalizing indigenous life ways or just reconnecting with our ancestors uh, for those of us who, who, who aren't indigenous, even though we're all indigenous to the, to the world. But oh. yeah, please, um, if you want to learn more about, about this prayer run and, and how to stand in a good way for, for our waters and for our future generations, you can follow us on the Instagram as well and the Facebook mm. at run number four salmon, R U N number four salmon, S A L M O N. And um, it, this, is, it, this journey this year is happening the 15th of September. It starts here in the Bay, and, and we're going to be carrying these really powerful, important prayers for our future generations, um, beginning in Segorite here in the Bay Delta Estuary and following uh, the path of the salmon all the way up to the McLeod River near Mount Shasta. Mm. So um, please join us and pray for the waters that, that are nourishing us as we speak. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to just approach it just a little bit different because, you know, I'm not as young as I used to be. Uh, so, but, but I do work with young people. And what I've seen, especially in my community, is where, um, especially um, because I think that there's like, of course, there's a, there's a, there's a little bit of a journey to, 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 that you have to take because my elders, like my parents, and just kind of going back to the other question quickly, um, I used, my parents would fight with me because I decided that I wanted to be a vegetarian. 
And so they were fighting me all the time. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. You're depriving your children and those types of things. And so what I think is, is especially when it comes to, um, especially when it comes to like social media and things like that, the elders in, in my community, they're, they have no way to communicate with the young people and they won't come to them. Right. They're more like I'm in this space over here and you're going to have to come to me so that I can tell you something. Whereas, you know, being that I'm like in the middle because I understand their concerns because there was a time I grew up reading books and I didn't have any type of, uh, you know, social media. But then, you know, I ended up working in IT field and I have a phone just like everybody else. And I do those types of things. I'm able to kind of bridge between the two because they can there's there's a there's a big gap that needs to be bridged there. So being able to get out of your space of being an elder to go to the young people and and let them be whatever it is that they're going to be and understand that, you know, it is a compliment. They have the initiate uh, initiation, the drive, the fire, mm -hmm. and then, you know, the elders hold the wisdom. So, you know, with the with that you can you can kind of guide guide something to where it needs to go. So really looking at those things is is what I've seen be, you know, uh, effective with the way that we're able to outreach to young people. And then at the same time, being able to outreach to elders and in many cases, bring them together in the same space by like holding like a family cooking class. So you get elders to come in, you get young people to come in and under the guise of food, then they all start to meld together and build culture together. So let's thank our speakers.